Well, good morning, beautiful image church. I've shared with my husband what I spoke on Empower Her Night. And with ladies, we covered the subject of what ifs and worries. And we thought it would be a great idea to actually, he thought it would be a great idea to bring it to the whole church. Because he said a lot of times, what ifs and worries is not necessarily for ladies only. We all worry. And so with that being said, there you have it. For those of you that were at the Empower Her, guess what? You will never have to worry ever in your life again because you get to hear it twice. It's going to be rubbed in. And those of you that were here for service, you get to hear it three times. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so definitely, you will never have an issue with any of the worries. You'll have a revelation. And if you didn't get it the first time, second time around, it'll be even more powerful. Amen? Amen. Would you just close your eyes for a second with me? Father, I thank you that you're here this morning. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're in this place. I pray that you will anoint me to speak and anoint them to hear. I thank you that you love every single person and you're so excited to touch every life. And we say, come and do what you want to do. Set us free. Have your way. We want to soar in your freedom and the life that you have for us. And everyone said, amen. So many years ago, when I just got married to John, and I was pregnant with our firstborn child, uh, Johnny. I was working downtown Seattle at that time. And I remember I was, I was walking to do a deposit. And I'm walking through the streets, and I see all these cars passing, and they're driving so fast. And um, just to give you a little bit of a background story, when we got married with John, the only argument we ever had was how fast he drives. So he's a guy who likes everything fast. Like, if you're going to bring something, bring it fast. If you're going to do something, do it fast. So his motto in life is like, just fast, fast. There's no time to waste. And so when he drives, it's kind of the same idea. It has to be fast. And so, and here I am walking pregnant and looking at all these cars and thinking, and you get that overwhelming thought, like, what if? We're driving in the car, and knowing that he drives fast, we get in a car accident, and my baby dies. And that thought was so overpowering and overwhelming. I mean, I was pregnant. Hormones were everywhere, so you do have to give a little bit of room for that. But I just started crying. So here I am. I'm walking to the bank. I am just bawling my eyes out. I came, and the girl who was the bank teller, she looks at me, and she, you know, she was counting, doing her thing, and then she would look at me, and then do her thing, and then look at me. And eventually she was like, are you okay? And I thought for a moment, what do I tell her? <laughs> the craziness that happened in my head? It didn't happen in reality? Like, I just had a what-if moment. It really didn't happen in reality. What do you say? You don't say anything. I'm like, yeah, I guess I'm okay. And so I walked back to my work, and, um, and of course, I meditated a little more. So I got there with red nose and red eyes, and they were like, Vita, are you okay? And I'm thinking, this is embarrassing. I can't share something that didn't happen, but apparently it happened in my head. And so when John came to pick me up, I was all worked up because apparently he killed the baby that wasn't even born yet because he's this fast driver. And, and you can imagine our ride back home. I'll just leave it at that. I'll leave it up to your imagination. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, and you're thinking, oh, this is, the, and it didn't really happen. So here we are years later. My son is going to be 17 soon. Uh, my husband is still driving fast, <laughs> all right? <laughs> there's, there's so many what ifs and worries. What if I am not enough? There's hundreds of what ifs that go through our head every day. What if I don't get that promotion? What if I don't get into that school? What if? if my life doesn't go the way I hope it would? What if my health is not there where it should be? What if I don't have what it takes? What if I won't have children? What if I won't get married 
and our mind can go on a spin of what ifs. This is just scratching the surface. But as we begin to ponder and really just zoom in to the process of thought sometimes we have, there's hundreds of other ones that sometimes if you share with somebody else, you're like, this is funny. My husband is teaching a class for premarital counseling, and he always shares that um, the role where men get their, their identity, their practical identity from is being a provider, being protector, and being a priest. And um, the worries and what ifs that men will have will come out of those areas. As a provider, can I provide for what is entrusted into my care? Can I provide for my loved ones? Can I have enough business to sustain me, to create a secure, peaceful environment in my household where my wife is not constantly screaming at me and asking, where is the cha-ching? And I go, well, just look around. Look around you, you know. I, I'm not blind. I'm just saying, just look around. <laughs> what do you think you see? And the poor man is like, I don't know. What do I see? Well, you got to up your game. Keep looking around. And so there's tremendous pressure of what ifs and worries. Can I bring that peace, that financial peace? And it goes into the area of protector. Can I protect the loved ones that are, again, entrusted into my care, that are, that are around me? And hear me right, it's not necessarily just protection, physical, making sure nothing happens to them, but it goes beyond, can I protect those around me, protect them from the wrong choices, from the wrong decisions. The minute you have kids, all of a sudden, you think differently. You're like, hey, I have worked so hard. I have put so much inside of, in you. I were up all those nights, not to just throw you away. You know, sometimes they say, fly, baby, fly. When parents want to do the act of fly, baby, fly, we want to make sure that when we do this, you can think the way we think. You can understand life and, and read the game and be able to see, okay, that person, that, that's opposition. That's offensive. That's, you, can, you can read the game of life and be like, this is what I got to do. So before father says, fly, baby, fly, he wants to make sure that you hear his voice. When you're in the middle of, of your 20 other boys and the stupidity comes, in your mind you can hear daddy saying I don't think so boy <laughs> if I were you I wouldn't do it when I was your age <laughs> that's dad's favorite when I was your age I had it all figured out so all of a sudden when you're there and you're in that setting you are ready you can hear you know what is right so to prepare, to protect your loved ones. You know, John and I, we are, we're a little different because for me, when kids come and ask me, Mom, can I hang out with my friends? I'm like, okay, go ahead. Dad's a little more intense. He's like, oh, sure, where are you going to go? With who you're going to go? Who's going to be there? For how long you're going to be there? Okay, go ahead. And he'll sit there in the 360. He's like, oh, they told me they're going here. Why are they going to a different street? <laughs> Hold on, I'll be right back. He jumps in the car. <laughs> Like, hi, guys, shows up in the middle of nowhere. Johnny's like, and Mandel, Dad, you're freaking us out. You're the only parent who randomly shows up in the middle of, of the street. And he's like, well, you told me you're going to this place. What are you doing here? He's like, the other street was blocked. <laughs> <laughs> he'll sit there and watch it, and he'll call him like 12, 12 a.m. Hey, boy, you said you were going to be home. What's going on? And, you know, that... That sense of protection. I want to protect the ones that I love. And it goes into the area of um, priest. Being a leader. Being able to lead. Being able to lead by example. Can I lead without words? Sometimes we can say so many things. But can I lead that when my children look at me, my example says it all. My life says it all. Can I be the priest, the leader that's, that, that shows the principles and the values that I'm talking about? And that's a lot of pressure. So a lot of your what, what, what ifs and worries are going to come out of that where you are going to think, well, I didn't really demonstrate that yesterday. How can I expect them to look up to me and make those right choices and make those right decisions? 
And so a lot of guys will, will be attacked in that area. You know, there's three main reasons that give birth to what ifs, that drive what ifs. Number one is experience. And sometimes it's bad experience. When I was 16, my friend was moving to um, Spokane, and I was driving with her in the car at that time. So she had her whole car packed, and um, we were together driving uh, that small car. Don't quote me. I think it was that Hadzu. They don't make those anymore, so I, I, I don't remember exactly what kind of car it was, but it was tiny. It was two doors. It was tiny. It was all packed. And as we were driving there, she turns around, and she says, hey, do you want to drive? And I'm being 16, I'm like, yes. And we were talking about stupidity. So, you know, <laughs> that was it right there. Um, and I was like, sure, let's do it. So packed car, I get in, I start driving. And as we're passing this, this uh, huge semi, I am, I'm driving by, I'm thinking, oh, this thing is so long. You know, you keep driving and it keeps going and going. And I'm like, oh my word, you're just getting a little tense. Right in the middle of that, her tire pops. And like literally in the, in the instant of seconds, you know, sometimes you think about so many things at the same time. And I felt my, the wheel and the car going under the semi truck. And in the instant, you know, everything inside of me thinking, this is it? This is how it's going to end? I didn't even start living. Like I'm only 16. I'm not ready to die. All of that was seconds. But I, and I was just, I got mad. I was like, I don't think so. I'm not dying under this, this monster. Because I mean, it was gigantic. And the car is so tiny. And you could literally, I could probably get under the truck. I'm telling you. And I looked at it and I was like, I don't think so. So I turned so hard to the left. And the car started turning over, flipping over and over and over and over again. So long story short, car was totaled. Um, her and I were okay. Um, nothing, nothing happened with our bodies. Thank you, Jesus. But that happened when I was 16. You should have a little video camera in our car when John and I are driving and if we're passing one of these long semi-trucks. Welcome. Ask John. <laughs> Ask John. The minute I see, it's like, what if comes back? What if it happens again? I'm like, ah, ah, go, ah, John, drive, ah, it's long, ah, faster, ah. And he's like, what is wrong with you? We got to cast out demons out of you, girl. He's like, you're freaking me out. Like, get a hold of yourself. I'm like, just either go fast or go slow. Like do either 20 miles an hour, let the truck pass you, or you speed. Like for me, I close my eyes. I'm like, ah, I just scream right through it. And so that's years later. We are talking. I was 16. And now I am. <laughs> 40. I'll tell you a little secret. All these years, it, was, it, had, a, it had an impact on me. What ifs? So a lot of times, bad experiences are going to do that. Number two is fear. Do you guys remember Snowmageddon last year? Yeah. I remember, I didn't even realize it was going to be this bad. We were just driving home, and I said, babe, we need some milk. So let's stop by Costco. So we walk into Costco, and I didn't, re I, I, I was like, what is going on? There's line of people all the way through the clothing section. And I'm thinking, we are underprepared. We're supposed to panic. We're supposed to pack the whole house with food. Look what people are doing. And we're not prepared for this, for this madness that's coming. And so here we are. We, we, we jumped the train. We did the same thing everybody else did. We bought everything we possibly could. <laughs> Only organic section was, was left. It's like, forget the health part. As long as we have food, right? So all the bread and all the donuts and all the good stuff was coming our way. And the milk coming home. Just to realize later on, we're like... And how do we eat all of this now? Okay. <laughs> it's fun buying it when you think you're going to be locked in the house for, for that many um, weeks, right? Remember the earthquake we had? That tiny one in the middle of the night some time ago. Was it a month ago? Uh, was it in July? I had to wake my husband up. I was like, John, John, John. By the time he woke up, the earthquake was gone. I was like, you missed it. <laughs> it was an earthquake and you missed it. And he's like, Really? I was getting my hair done, and the girl who was doing my hair, and she says, Vita, that earthquake has turned my world upside down. She goes, I have become so anxious, and 
worried that she's like, I, I got all of my paperwork. I put it in a Ziploc bag that if tsunami hits, all of my paperwork, all of my passports and my social security, everything's in one place. She's like, I am panicking. I've got food everywhere in my house because I think the big one is coming. That one was just a warning. The big one is coming. And she's like, and she had to drop off her, um, her daughter in Seattle. She's like, I wouldn't come near Seattle because they're going to go underwater. She's like, I can't live. It, it, like, it took over me. Fear, that's what fear is going to do to you. What ifs and worries? And a third one is lack of faith, doubt. I don't know or don't believe that God is my provider. Therefore, I'm going to save every penny I possibly can, work as much as I possibly can, as many hours as I possibly can, because I can only rely on myself. I don't know or don't believe that God has plan, purpose, future, hope, destiny for my life. So therefore, I'm just going to live one day at a time, and whatever happens, happens. I don't know or don't believe that God is my protector. Therefore, I'm going to lock everything I possibly can and have many different plans. We were talking, my son, Mendel, one time he says, Mom, I've got a plan. If somebody shows up in my house, this is where I'm running. Up to the, <laughs> up to the attic. You know, we, we go through so many different variations of like, what would we do because I'm only relying on myself. Um, I, I don't know if you ever had that. Maybe I'm the only weirdo who ever experiences it now and then. Um, you know that moment when you're in bed and you're just about to fall asleep and your blanket is so warm and the pillow is like a cloud under you and you're right about to just doze off into that la-la land. You just get this thought. Have you locked the door? And you go, oh, no. Oh, no. Don't even come right now because there's no way I'm getting out of my warm bed. It's cold out there. I just warmed up. It took me half an hour to warm up my feet because when my feet are cold, I can't fall asleep. They're finally warm. That means I can finally <laughs> go to sleep. I am not getting up. No. And then you just get this fear like, no, go check the doors. And you're like, fine. You get up and you go check all the doors. Come lay down and you get another thought. But what about the windows? <laughs> They're in the first floor. It's so easy to get in. Did you lock them? I'm like, oh, man, go downstairs again, check all the windows, and you go lay down. You're like, okay, done, and you get another thought, but what about the cars? Have you checked your cars? Have you locked your cars? Because every car, and you've got three of them on the driveway, because now our son has one, and every single one of them has a garage door opener in there. Anybody can open the car, open your garage door, and they're in your house, and I'm like, no, oh man, I get up and I lock the cars. And as I'm about to pass the kitchen, you get a thought, but what about the gas stove? You don't know who was cooking last. And I was like, thank you. Thank you that the thought came now because I would not want it to, to come when I'm in bed. Thank you. Check the stove. I'm like, this is great. And, and, and then you lay down. But what about that door from the garage? Because Boom, and, and you're just like, enough is enough. Anybody can come in and do anything they want. I am not getting out of this bed. This is, this is done. Because I rely on myself. And, and I'll be honest, we, we had a tragedy in my family where uh, four of our family members have been murdered. So maybe a lot of it is rooted in the what ifs and worries, what happened to our family. So I have to fight my battle where I don't live in doubt and um, in fear, but I choose to stand my ground that if God said, I will lay down and sleep in peace for you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. A lot of times you, you just got to take that scripture and be like, you know what? I'm going to stand and believe that word instead of laying in my bed, shaking in anxiety, worrying that no one's going to break in. I'm just going to take that word and I'm going to claim it over my life. I thank you that you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. I'm just going to rebuke my what ifs and what and I trust you tonight. 
I don't want to live my life in doubt. I don't want to live my life worrying with lack of faith. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. He has given us the spirit to overcome, overcome that fear. A lot of times people say, I don't know. I've just been so afraid lately. Maybe God is teaching me something. Maybe God is showing me something. Maybe there's different areas of my life that God just wants to bring to my attention. I want to tell you the breakthrough thought this morning. God has nothing to do with fear. He will never teach you anything through fear. He will never show you anything through fear. He's not trying to get your attention through fear. God is the opposite of fear. He says, I gave you spirit of power to overcome fear. I am opposite of fear on the opposite direction come on those of us that are that love to worry we find an excuse and we say well I'm just this is just the way I am I love to worry 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 I'm just a worrier I I worry about today worry 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 I'm busy 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 worrying and then tomorrow I worry 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 and then third day I worry a little more this is just me how God designed me absolutely not <laughs> God hasn't designed us that way. What we have done, we caved in. We gave in. We gave, we gave up, okay? Because this is what the Word of God says. Matthew 6, 25, 27, he says, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink and enough clothes to wear. So he's covering basic necessities of life. Food, drink, clothes. But there's so much more that goes into our everyday life that we find a way to worry about. So you're welcome, add those in. It's in the scripture. God doesn't want you to worry about it. Bring it all together. And he says, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? And then he says, look at the birds. They, okay, so hear me now. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. Okay, so here's the principle here. We were talking to, um, to my son, and he says, Mom, we were sitting at the lunch table, and my son, Mandel, and he says, my friends that are not Christian, they were telling me, I can never be Christian because all you got to do, because you just got to do and do and do and do. What we're missing, the principle here, it's not about doing, it's about being because this is what God has and somehow when we when we got saved that mentality still stayed with us I need to pray a little harder then God's gonna bless me today I had an urge to punch him and I and I didn't so therefore God's just gonna honor my self-control and then he's gonna bless me in the area of relationships I fasted a little more so therefore I can expect God's blessing upon my family or upon my children somehow in our mindset we are deserving we are earning we think if I qualify myself if I do more if I perform more if I show up more then maybe just maybe God will provide and look what he says they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. He says, I feed you because I am your father. Not because you have earned, not because you have prayed, not because you have fasted, not because you didn't punch him, not because you up held yourself together. None of that. It is not by works. It is by the simple principle that I am your father and nothing can separate you from my love. You are my son. Doesn't matter what happens. You are Mandel Petrus. You are my boy. You don't have to earn. Yes, you've got to do your bed and X, Y, and Z, but you know, doing your bed doesn't qualify you to be my son. I'm still providing. I'm still feeding and I am mindful. How are you? Babe, we gotta eat. How are you doing? What are you feeling for breakfast? I am mindful because he is my son. They are our children. Somehow when it comes to father, we're thinking the deserving mentality. Well, I gotta deserve, I've gotta earn, I've gotta have a lot more merits, a lot more credits. Maybe then, maybe then God will bless me. And God says, absolutely not. I am your father. Let me say it again. I am your father and I care for you and I want more for you than what you want for yourself because this is my nature. And I love it how he finishes this verse. He says, aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? And he says, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? 
Let me translate it. If you spent your whole life worried, you wouldn't be able to add a single moment to your life. That wouldn't change a thing. You would have just wasted your whole life being worried. If you stayed up all night, worried, 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 it wouldn't have changed a thing about tomorrow. If anything, it's probably going to backfire and, and, and take you even in a, in a different direction. Our son, Johnny, is an athlete, and football season is approaching. So in the summertime, as parents, you're a little anxious uh, because you have to be on the field uh, going against 380-pound blessing. And so we're thinking, we're just going to bulk this boy up. He's, he needs a little more mass on him. So we, we asked, a, you know, a person who, who does that. And we said, we need you to just bulk him up. Like, what do we do? He says, I got it. So we signed him up in the gym where he's going to be lifting weights and bulking up. And, and we, we sent him to the store. I was like, anything, anything. Here's the card. We need this boy to get big. And so um, they come back with like, car full of groceries. This is it. This is going to do it. He's going to get big. And then my whole pantry has protein shakes of all kinds. And so here we are. We're like, eat baby, eat. Eat boy, eat. So here we are. Before he leaves, I'm like, come here. Here's your protein shake. We got to put that mask on. Come on. He comes back. We're like, did you eat today? Come on. You got to eat. Football season's approaching. We need you to be a little bit bigger. We were so worried and so stressed out about him gaining weight that by the end of our process, before the football season started, he lost eight pounds. <laughs> I was like, how did we work so hard? We have done everything we possibly could. And he stood on the scale and he lost eight pounds. <laughs> this is what worry is going to do to you. Instead of going in the right direction, you're going to be so sick, worried, that you're just going to end up where you don't want to be. How many times we toss and turn at night, coming back with a plan A and B and C, and if that's not going to work, fine, then I'll pull out my card X, Y, and Z. But these three, I'm sure these are going to work. Let's do this. And then we have it all figured out. We even have the conversations. I, you know, if my boss is going to tell me this, I'm going to tell him that. I'm going to pull, pull this card and, and, and just tell him how dare he is to even think to tell me that. But you know what? I'm ready for that. Bring it. Bring it. The minute you tell me this, I am going to tell you. And then we have all these imaginary things going in our mind just to wake up in the morning and be like, I am tired. I am exhausted. I have wasted the whole night instead of sleeping. In getting rest. The word of God says, for, for God gives rest to those he loves. Instead of enjoying the love of God and the rest, knowing that he's in control, I have just exhausted my night just to wake up and find out that nothing has happened. The only thing has changed is me being tired. That's the only difference. That's how far I've gotten. Philippians 4, 6, 7 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I absolutely love the word anything. Don't worry about anything. Someone said, do you know what's anything in Greek? It's anything. Absolutely anything. Somehow we find a way to divide our worries. We're like, no, this is a small size. This one is medium. This is a large. And here's the extra large. So these are different kinds of worries. So it's okay not to worry about the extra small one and a small one, medium. But you know what? When it comes to the extra large, I bet you even God is worried about that one. Because that one is life and death. This is, oh my, if, if that doesn't come through, I can't imagine what's going to happen. And we find a way to excuse our worry. And we find a way like, no, 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 no. And somehow we as people, we jump on board and we're like, hey, how's it going? Man, I've been worried about you. Woof, what you're going through. Ah, I am, ah, keep us updated because we're all worried. Like, your worry is so big that we're all worried. We're all kind of on board with, we're all worrying with you. Oh, no, don't come yet. <laughs> I am, not, my husband's anointing upon me. <laughs> oh, um, give, give me five more minutes, would you please? Thank you. But pray about everything. Pray about everything. The same way how we approach 
anything. We think, oh, this is too small. I don't, you know, I don't want to bother God with this one. I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna worry this one out. I'll worry about it. And I'll keep the big ones for God. And God says, no, if this is big enough for you to worry about, it's big enough for you to pray about. Pray about everything. When you go to the store and you think that you feel like something took over you and you want to buy everything. Someone told me, I don't know what happens to me. I come to the store and I just want it all. Pray. God, I pray for everything. I want everything right now. So I don't know if I want to buy everything or maybe help me to control myself and, and not buy 10 pairs of jeans, only one. You know, before, before you make that decision on the car, Lord, I'm going to buy this car and it's going to put us in a financial tension for the next five years. Do I want that car? Help me. Pray about everything. I love the powerful word in the middle of it. Don't worry about anything, but instead pray. But instead pray. This is your weapon because worries are going to come. You might say, you know what? I'm not a worry. I, I don't worry. Today you don't worry. Tomorrow it's going to come and find you. All of a sudden, something's going to be so big that you're like, I thought I wasn't the person who worries. And here I am, a mess, a disaster. Somebody help me. I can't think straight. I can't, I can't concentrate. I can't do any of that. This is your weapon. When those worries do come, you know what to do. You are ready. I don't know if you guys ever get that because at night when I wake up, it's like my, my mind is like computer. So when I wake up and, and it starts scanning files right away, like, okay, is everything good? Everything's good family. Everything's good marriage. Everything's good kids. School is good. Ha, ah, virus. Here we go. There we go. Now we found something to worry about. And my mind just goes on a spin of planning and this and that. I mentioned my boy uh, playing football and um, football season approaching. And literally, I would wake up at night almost sick worried because last season when he played, he ended up with like six broken fingers. His body was beat up. And, and as a mom, you're thinking, because you're, you're, more, you're more worried about academics. You're thinking, oh, half of the school year he had one cast. Another school year he had another cast. And uh, your mind just goes in the spin. I, like, how is he going to write? And then he had to learn how to type and write with the left hand. And once he got that figured out, we had to put a cast on that one. Then he had to go back to the right one. And, you know, as a mom, you just begin to worry, worry, worry. And now this is what I do. I take out my weapon and I'm thinking, you know what? My worrying here at night, it's not like he comes on the field and all of a sudden, because I worried all these nights, his fingers are protected and his body's protected. Absolutely not. It's not going to help him on the field. My worries at night are not going to do anything. So what I do when those worries come and my computer finds the virus, like, oh, oh, that's right. Football season's starting. There is something to worry about. I begin to pray, Lord, I thank you. That as he gets out on that field, angels of the Lord are going to come out with him. I thank you for your divine protection that when those 380 pound blessings are coming his way, you will find a way to protect his blind spots. You are God who's ultimately in charge. So I begin to use the weapon, but instead pray. Come on. God is not telling us, don't worry. Do nothing. You know the Akuna Matata, Lion King, you watched uh, Puma, uh, Timon and Pumbaa. Um, Akuna Matata means no worries for the rest of the day, right? It's a problem-free philosophy. Akuna Matata. The only problem with them, they did, they worried about nothing and they did absolutely nothing. They didn't get anywhere. They had no plan. No purpose. It was just whatever happens, happens. God is not telling us, oh, just don't worry. Everything is going to work itself out. He says, do not worry, but do pray. Prayer is action. That's your weapon. This is the way you fight. Do not worry, but do pray. Come on. And I think we are to realize when all of a sudden we're getting those worries, I know just the right thing to do. And he goes on to say, tell God what you need and thank him with the prayer and thanksgiving. A lot of times we, we pray about something and we feel like, well, one God, once God will answer my prayer, then I'm going to lighten up. Then you will see, do you see me right now? My shoulders and the way I'm walking and I'm so sad. That means I'm still praying and believing. God is, God is working somewhere, but not really like, not yet. When you see me light up 
and I got a smile on my face, and I am singing and jumping and dancing. That means the Lord has answered my prayer. So what he says here, tell God what you need and thank him for it. So that means it is done. What he's telling you, thank him for what he has done. What he's doing here, he's pointing at the cross. He says that healing you're praying about, it was done at the cross. That's why you can go ahead and put a smile on your face the minute you prayed about your healing because you know Jesus Christ has paid the price on the cross and that gives me boldness and that gives me courage. So when I come and say, Lord, come and just heal my body from head to toe, I thank you for what you have done on the cross. When I come and I, and I pray for my children, I know that you have died on the cross. You have paid the price for my family today. Therefore, I can boldly come and pray and declare and be happy and rejoice today when I don't even see the outcome of it yet because I know it was done on the cross. When I'm praying for my family, when I'm praying for my marriage, I can rejoice because I know it was already done. That's why he says, don't look at yourself. Thank him for what he has done because by thanking him for what he has done, you're tapping in to your promise. It was already given. It is done. He has paid the price. Jesus shed his blood. It is finished. So what you are doing you're tapping in to the promises that are given to you already the gift the blessing thank him for what he has done and I love it how he finishes this verse he says and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. How can you be so calm in the midst of the storm? How can you be cool in the midst of this craziness, what's going on around you? I don't know. But there's peace of God that transcends, that surpasses. I can't understand it. I can't explain it. I don't know how. I don't know what way, but I know that God is in control. I don't see exactly how he's going to do it, but I know that he will. How can your mind be so at peace Explain, how is God going to do it? What is God going to do? How he's going to show? There's no way out. Look, you are trapped. This is it. But I know that doesn't matter what my circumstance looks like. I know the one who is in charge of the direction of the ship. I know that he's navigating. And yes, maybe my ship has encountered the storms, the winds, the weather, and it's shaking, and it's crazy, and I don't understand. But in the midst of that, I know that my heart and my mind, there's that peace of God. He is leading and he's guiding. You know, what are some worries that devil has been attacking our lives, your life, not allowing you to soar because you're constantly keep looking at yourself because we constantly keep thinking, what can I do? It's me. And I love it. He says, your heavenly father, your heavenly father will worry about it. It is not your worry. Your everyday life is not your worry. I want you guys to display worksheet. I want you to take a look at it. Those are some areas in our life, and I mean some areas in our lives. There's so much more. You guys can dim the lights. What are the areas that we're getting attacked? Is it the family? Is it career? Is it health? Is it marriage? What's keeping you up at night? Is it finances? Is it your retirement? Will I have enough? Will I be a burden? Is there anyone around me 
who will be taking care of me? Is it their appearance, children, safety, relationships, acceptance? judgment, people's opinions? What are some worries? God says, hey, this morning I want to set you free. This morning I want you to grasp the understanding and revelation that uh, let me take care of it. Let me worry. Let me do it. And I want you to do your part. Church, this morning, we're going to do the instead part. All those worries that you saw, this morning, we're going to take out the weapon that's given to you, the instead part. And we're going to begin to pray and declare and proclaim God's presence all over those areas. All right, would you just stand on your feet? I want to give you a couple of minutes. And I want you to pray over your life. No one else knows your worries. Can we pick up the music a little bit so they can, they can have a little, bit, a little bit of privacy? I want you to take a moment and address some of those worries. What are those things? Acceptance. Who is supposed to accept you? If we're all trying to fit in, who are we fitting in with? Who is the one supposed to accept? That's where you're supposed to get the freedom from the Lord. Hey, you have designed me. You have created me fearfully and wonderfully. I've got what it takes in Christ Jesus. Come on. Realizing that you have done it on the cross. I thank you that the healing that I'm praying about, I thank you that I can celebrate because it is already done. The restoration of marriage that I'm praying about it. I thank you that it's already done on the cross. You have paid that price for me. Whatever you're worried about, whatever you're, 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 you're thinking, the what ifs that's occupying your mind, God says, I don't want you to live like that. I want you to soar. I want you to soar. I want you to be fearless. I want you to be bold and courageous, not being afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow. But wake up tomorrow and be bold and say, I am so excited for what God has in store for me. Come on. Great things are going to happen today because God is on my side. Great things are going to happen today because God is navigating my ship. Because God is leading and directing me. Because God is showing me what to do, how to do it. There's the wisdom of God that surpasses all understanding. It is resting on my life. Come on. But instead, but instead, but instead, but instead, instead of all of your worries, begin to declare the presence of God. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're in control. We thank you. This morning we declare the name of Jesus above all names. This morning we thank you that your hand is upon our life. We thank you that you reign. We thank you that your love is all over us and we don't have to try to fit in. We don't have to try to be somebody we're not because your love overwhelms and takes over. Church, can we worship just for a minute? Come on, begin to worship God in the areas of your worries. Begin to declare and celebrate and sing about the goodness of God. No longer being 